I'm, I'm David Cadena, I'm one of the family physicians here in this clinic and the medical director of our Hill Country Clinic as well. Um, and back there, I'm having the slides run. We have a couple people back there as well. Our, our practice manager, Joanne Rios, and Stephanie Rodriguez, our supervisor. So it's, some, it's a team effort for some of these things, but I appreciate your coming out here. And I know now it's getting dark on us a lot earlier, so we won't keep you the whole time. Uh, there'll be some flexible time at the end here to, to talk through things. But thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, this particular topic today on our Healthy Living series is about eating healthy on a budget. So it can be very, very difficult at times. And the way that we kind of categorize some of these things um, is through the five A's. But just in general, um, since COVID, a lot of things have been much worse, right? Including food insecurity. Food insecurity, there's a definition on here that says difficulty at some point in the year providing enough food for all members in the household. But I'd actually take that a little step further in that it's also in acquiring food in a socially acceptable way. So what that means is, is it's quote unquote normal to go to a food pantry to get food. Um, are you needing to buy food on food stamps using SNAP benefits? That's considered food insecurity still, even though you have kind of a lifeline to food. So food insecurity has increased greatly um, up until 2010, but COVID really amplified things, putting 34 million people at food insecurity of some sort in the United States. Um, that number is a little skewed because you can see the bottom one that talks about 53 million people requiring assistance from some of the community things like food banks. Uh, so that's why I add in that other aspect. This really should be in a socially acceptable way that we're able to get food. Food access is where the five A's come in, right? So that's availability. Is there an abundance of food? Do you live further out in Bernie and there's not many places around you? Um, so rural versus urban is where that discussion comes in for the most part, right? When you talk about inner city, it also becomes somewhat of a food desert at times though. People are going to the grocery store to buy that $2 banana, $3 banana, instead of going to our local grocery stores and getting those things. Uh, so the availability is, is a big, big one. We don't feel it here as much in South Texas because, as you know, we have a big, big grocery chain that goes where the people are, basically. So we've been pretty, pretty uh, lucky for that one. Uh, accessibility. You go to the grocery store. Now, are there limitations for you, right? Are, are you riding around in a shopping cart? Can you reach up on the high shelves? Um, the accessibility component is not thought about as much if you don't have any problems, right? That's why we tend to forget those, those people that can't reach certain things or can't walk through the whole grocery store and we're making these massive stores, right? So the accessibility is, is one, other, one other possibility. Affordability, that's where it comes into play too, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about today uh, for the most part, because that's what somewhat we can control. Um, the accommodation, so accommodation is, is talking about cultural fits uh, for the most part. So are you able to buy foods that you like, right? So are we able to find Tex-Mex food? Are we able to find Chinese food? Is it a right cultural fit? Is there a store near you that even has those foods, right? Um, I have a good friend that he's Korean. Like he wants Korean food and you can't find it in a lot of places unless you know where you're going. So when he's moved here, he had to figure it out. Right, so some of that weighs and in, takes into consideration too. And acceptability circles us back to, is it socially acceptable to reach out to our community partners like food banks for assistance? So that's where we really talk about hunger, hunger in America, food insecurity, or those five A's. Next one. Uh, budget, so my example up here is using the Supplemental Nutrition and Assistance Program, right? So SNAP benefits, there's monthly income limitations for that, obviously. On the right column there, though, is the amount that you get for that, right? 
So we're, if we have a family of four, we need to feed everybody on an $830 budget for that entire month, right? Uh, what that breaks down to though, on an individual basis is $8 a day, right? $8 a day to feed yourself is a difficult ask, right? So a couple of things that we'll talk about, a couple of different recipes, and we'll send you home with one too. But our goal is to get our servings close to four dollars, right? Get two meals in at least. Um, some of this relies on are there your kiddos there? Are there school benefits too? But as you can see, it can get kind of hard to, to get to that point, right? Um, a good breakdown of what you should be spending in the grocery store. This is kind of a standard variation that you'll see whenever you search for things. What should my money be going to, right? Um, you can break it down even more. I, I used my example as $50 though. So $50 you have, you're going to the store, what should you buy? Well, the breakdown should really be associated with a, a pyramid that I'm gonna show you in a little while. That's where you wanna spend your money on the bottom and work your way up. Obviously some things cost more than others, so we're, we're gonna go through some tips and tricks on how to, how to modify what you're buying, right? But the main thing is out of that $50, $12 on vegetables, $10 on fruits. I mean, that's $22, almost half, and that's what you should be eating. That is actually in alignment with what we should be eating, right? 50% of our stuff should be fruits and vegetables, low calorie, high vitamin, high mineral foods, right? $10 for proteins, that's hard for a lot of people, I would say, right? Um, proteins are not just meat, though. That's another huge take-home point, okay? There are cheaper ways to get meat. Um, there's like, other kinds of cuts of meat you can buy. The trouble with that is that those cuts of meat tend to be much more fat in them or have much more fat in them than the lean, more expensive cuts of meat. So this is where you really want to utilize things like beans, other legumes, nuts, lentils. Uh, so that's another big category for, uh, for protein. Lentils is, is an underutilized thing. Um, $8 for grains, $8 for dairy, and $2 for oils. Those are mostly for cooking, uh, so preparation. Um, another big thing is making sure you have a good stocked pantry with reasonable dried ingredients even so that they go even further for you right um, and I would say that's probably one of the more expensive things is building that pantry over time um, but it's an important thing because in the long run uh, you will save a lot more money doing those things yeah. so again our goal under five try to get as close as we can to four for a lot of these things okay um, next slide please Okay, so this is the pyramid that I was speaking about. So a gold standard diet, and for most people, I would say is a Mediterranean style of diet, right? A plant-based diet is also very, very good, um, but it is difficult to conform to a plant-based diet unless you are, you are used to very low, low meats already, right? Um, have, uh, there's a lot of different diets out there, right? Have you all heard of a keto diet? Has anybody ever tried a keto diet or willing to say they've tried a keto diet? No? Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, <laughs> keto diet. <laughs> so, keto diet, I would say, is the most brought up diet that I have with patients here. Everybody has tried it. Everybody wants to try it. Um, <clears throat> we don't really recommend it, though, right? Uh, a keto diet... You can use it to help you lose weight on a short-term basis, is what I would say. But in the long term, it is not the heart-healthy diet. Um, for longevity, for heart health, for minimizing risks of dementia, it is a Mediterranean or plant-based style of eating, right? When I mention plant-based, when I mention Mediterranean, it's kind of turned away from people just because they think about it as that's a high fish thing. I don't like fish. That's not the style of food I eat, but that's why I say it's a Mediterranean style, right? You can make something a Mediterranean style kind of easily. Okay. What's a common 
meal that you all like? What's a common dinner that you all eat? Fast food. Fast food, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> Mexican, okay. What's your favorite Mexican plate? Uh, <laughs> okay, what do you eat there? Do you eat chicken? Do you eat enchiladas, chalupas? Everything. Everything, all right, all right. I like that one. <clears throat> well, so when you think about Mexican food, it is actually primarily vegetable-based, minimal proteins, right? The trouble is, here we're mixing in Tex-Mex, right? Tex-Mex is high sauce, high cheese, right? Like chips and queso, that's not a thing when you go to Mexico, really. I mean, it, it is a Tex-Mex thing, you know? Um, so when you think about enchiladas, for example, right, that can be a Mediterranean style. It just may not look like a traditional Mediterranean dish, though, right? Small amounts of protein, it can be lean cuts of beef, it can be chicken that's thrown in there, mixing it with other things like lentils, veggies, that can be in the filling of the enchilada, right? Corn tortillas, what category of food are corn tortillas? If you think about foods, if you had to put it there, it's a carbohydrate, right? But it's actually a whole grain. Corn is a whole grain, right? So it doesn't look like on a plate nicely stacked, like that would, it is rolled up <laughs> and it is in there stuffed, right? So that's how you can still eat a Mediterranean style of diet, okay? Beans, they're legumes, they're high protein. We add the fats when we go out to eat. We fry it and then we refry it, right? Refried beans, so they're double fat almost. And then we add bacon, <laughs> and that's another thing to add on top, right? And then we add cheese on top of it. That's where we get into trouble, okay? The extras is how we get into trouble a lot of the time, especially when eating out, right? Um, so again, you can do it, right? The rice, rice isn't horrible. I know a lot of times there's a stigma and you shouldn't eat a lot of rice. I would say when you think about traditional Asian cultures, they eat a ton of white rice, right? They are not traditionally overweight, right? In, in those countries nowadays, they are having some obesity issues because now they're adding in some of the processed things and in some of the American things. So it's been skewed a little bit that way. But rice is, is not bad, right? Brown rice is even better. So in order to, the differences between white and brown rice, they're calorie-wise pretty similar, okay? Nutrition label is pretty similar, except when you look at the fiber, right? Except when you look at the minerals. White foods in general are processed foods, right? We strip them of their fiber, we strip them of their vitamins, and then we send it out there in a nice package for people to eat. So brown rice in general has more fiber, it's a more acceptable thing. And we make a lot of Mexican brown rice is what I would say. <laughs> okay, okay. So it can be shifted that way. Okay. Um, this is called my plate. You'll see different variations sometimes. Um, but similar to what I was saying about spending your money, your plate looks like that, right? 50% of it is vegetables. 50% of it can be fruits. Okay. You'll see other variations of my plate that includes milk on the side there. Dairy is a small component of a Mediterranean type of diet. Um, so we usually include water on that my plate description. So that's what your plate should generally look like. Okay. Uh, so breaking it up like that. Um, on the very top, I know it's a little small to see, but that's where you have your meats. That's where you have your sweets. Okay. Sweets are a double hit, right? They are high fat. They are high processed sugar. So that's why it's on top, right? It doesn't mean don't love and live your life, it just means it should be on the smaller side of things, right? Okay. Uh, the other thing that I would point out, is the reason is fish is a big part of a Mediterranean style is actually because of the benefits, right? Take salmon, for example, high vitamin D, high in omega-6s, which is okay. Omega-3s is where the bang for your buck is, though, right? So they're very high in omega-3s. Uh, so they're very good sources of the meat, if we're going to pick something like that. Okay. Um, have you all seen this before, uh, that kind of food pyramid? No? Okay. That's newer than, like, back in the day, right? 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's a little bit newer and it's a different style, right? Try not to pay too much attention to the wine picture, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that. You saw that. Yeah. So, so in the Mediterranean, it's a lot of wine. The the evidence doesn't say it's bad, but I think the problem is that that's just what they are used to drinking as a culture. I don't know that there's a ton of added benefits. To get true benefits from wine, you'd have to drink more than we want you to drink, right? So if you like it, it's a small amount and that's included, but it's up there, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, and if you all have questions about some of the figures or anything that I said, you can feel free to kind of stop me during this. It's, I, I, it's nice to have a little bit more of an interactive presentation than just my up here spewing information to you. So please stop me, okay? Sure. Sure. So the question is, why is milk and dairy not part of this particular pyramid? It's actually on, on the top. It's the second from the top. It's not big in there, but that's where we list the cheese. That's where we list the yogurt. Okay. So when you think about yogurt, yogurt is, but again, we have to be really careful with yogurt. Okay. It is a highly advertised product, which means those labels can fool us sometimes. Okay. So most times if you go and buy a regular yogurt, it is going to be quite high in sugar. Okay. And it's processed sugar. It is added sugar. Okay. So what is preferred but may not be as tasty is actually kind of a non-fat yogurt, particularly a Greek style of yogurt, which is nice and thick. You can use it for a lot of things, right? So we prefer that you sweeten the yogurt on your own. Okay, that can be through natural berries, a small amount of honey, maple syrup. And if you're really trying to cut sugar, sugar-free maple syrup, right? Um, you have to be very careful reading the amount of sugar that's on these yogurts and the fats too, okay? So would honey or maple syrup be a better choice than the white sugar? Yes, usually, okay. You have to remember honey is, is a condensed form of sugar too though and it's much more easy to overdo it than if you're sprinkling a little bit of sugar on something. Okay. Uh, the serving size of honey, it's about a tablespoon uh, and it, it'll have maybe 15 grams of sugar so it's packed in there. So you just have to be careful with the amount. That's where we, again, we'll get into trouble. Okay. Okay. So Think about other things that are sweet and put them in the yogurt is, is preferred. Okay. And really it's a play of texture too. Most people, they don't necessarily want the yogurt, just the sliminess gets them. So think about the textural components to enjoy, right? Can you get the fruit? Can you get a little bit of nuts in there? That's how you make it more enjoyable too. Okay. All right. We can go to the next slide there. Okay. Now you're at the store. This is where you're going to make more impacts. Okay. So these are some tips and tricks when you're at the store. What do you do? Right. Have you all heard don't shop hungry before? Have you ever tested that before? Yeah. A lot of head, head nodding. Okay. So it's a real thing. It's actually been researched that you will buy more when you are hungry shopping. Okay. Be open to generic brands. That's another big one. Store brand. Uh, store brands can be much more reasonable um, than some of the national name brand things and they're of pretty similar quality. Okay. Uh, shop during sales, another big one. Using coupons, another huge one. So look at that ad, right? Uh, seasonal shopping, much more important when it comes to talking about fresh fruits, fresh bread, vegetables. Uh, that's a big one. Buy in bulk and freeze. That's an easier said than done thing, right? If you're on a fixed income, you're one person, nobody's going to expect you to go to a big warehouse store and buy those huge logs of meat and freeze them, right? That can be a difficult thing sometimes, but thinking about it on even a smaller scale sometimes. Um, so it could even be things like buying small packages of meats and freezing that portion. When we talk about the style of diet we're trying to shift away from, you don't want a big portion of steak. You don't want a pound of hamburger meat in your meal. It's really a four to six ounce serving that we're having. So it's even freezing those. Okay. 
That way we don't feel bad. We don't want to feel wasteful on some of these things. Okay. And then nutrition labels, it's a big difference uh, in what you're buying. Our, the example we're going to use right now are beans, right? Dried beans, I admit they're harder to prepare, but if you're on a tighter budget, it is much better. Okay. Here, this 16 ounce bag of dried beans costs $1.15. 16 ounce of canned beans cost $1.32. So you'd look at that and say, I mean, what's the big deal? It's in a can, I can open it, it's only 15 cents more. Not a big problem for some people, right? But for others it is, right? I, I mean, one can of beans maybe feeds one person, two people. You have to really stretch it. The difference is when you look at the nutrition label, it'll also have the serving size there. So if you look at the serving size on the dry beans, that whole bag can make about three cups of beans, right? I mean, it'll give you three cups of dried beans. That three cups of dry beans will turn into six cans of beans. Okay. So it, it's almost time six because they're doing a lot of the work for you. They're making the beans, right? It will also be more nutritional for you in the sense that you can control the sodium you're adding in. You can control the flavor of your beans, right? So I, I would be cautious with cans. Obviously, cans will last a long time. They're more on the reasonable side. It's, I think of it as a convenience type of food, though. If you really want to save and pinch those pennies, it is the dried things that you need to buy. Okay. All right. And of course, everybody remembers the old saying, beans, beans, the more you eat, the more you... Save, right? Save, okay. All right, all right, all right. All right. I've never heard that one. <laughs> so beans are, are an impressive source of protein, okay? Lentils, like I mentioned too, they, they will give you a big, big punch um, if, if you're willing to switch to those. Okay. All right. Fresh or frozen? We're going to take this line by line here, okay? And we're going to use that example in a little bit. So which is less expensive generally, fresh or frozen? Fruits, vegetables, things like that. Frozen, frozen. So frozen. Go ahead and click it. So frozen foods. Yeah, Frozen foods tend to be less expensive. Well, um, the texture can change sometimes, but overall, they're very good. Okay. Let's go to the next one here. Which has better nutrients? Do you want to buy the fresh because it has better nutrients? Or are you okay buying the cheaper alternative of frozen? So which do you think has more nutrients, fresh or frozen? Fresh foods. Okay. Depends <laughs> is, the, is a little bit of the answer. But in general, uh, fruits, for example, it's actually the frozen that, ha that are more nutritious for you. And the reason for that is they are picked, they are ripe, they are flash frozen, and everything is preserved, ready to go. So when you're eating a frozen fruit, it might as well have been straight off the vine, ready to ripe, ready and ripened. Okay. And that's where you use it in your yogurt. That's where you can use it in those things because now it is much more reasonable. Right? Another, or I'll wait till the slide's over, I suppose. That's true, <laughs> that's true, that's true. That's how you can shop out of season too. Yeah. Okay, do you all know what the shelf life of a fresh broccoli is? If you had to guess, what would you say? How long does it last when you buy broccoli? When does it start to get brown and slimy on you all is the question, right? Five days. Yeah, yeah, so it technically can last a little bit longer than that. Uh, it can last a couple months. When you buy it, how long has it already been out though, right? So that's where we run into trouble. How dirty is it? Is there bacteria on it already that's starting to decrease that shelf life more and more? So the next question is, what's the shelf life of frozen broccoli? <laughs> it depends how, how, how much freezer burn do you want to taste, I guess, right? Okay, okay. Uh, 12 months, yeah, 12, 12 months generally. It can likely last a little bit longer to the freezer burn point, uh, but 12 months is the generally acceptable maintaining maximal nutrition time frame. Okay. How do you make broccoli last two to three months, fresh broccoli? I mean, 
Yeah, I, th I think broccoli, you kind of have to wash it, make sure there's no little microbes on it, and it, it would be difficult. Yeah, I, truthfully, I don't think it's lasted two months. Unless I forgot about it and went back and looked, it still wouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure, but that's the technical lifespan. Well, uh, another big point about fruits, frozen fruits in particular, you can utilize them for a lot of things, right? Smoothies, okay? Smoothies, and you're blending the fresh fruit, it can maintain some fiber in it. Juicing things, juicing fresh fruits, there's no fiber. You're, you're just taking out all of the vitamins and minerals, draining the leftover, and drinking it. Okay. So just be careful with the juicing versus actually making a smoothie, actually blending things. Um, who here likes ice cream? Ice cream? Ice cream? Oh, frozen yogurt people over here. Okay. All right. So... There, there's a nice way to make a good ice cream impersonator. Okay. Um, have you all had frozen bananas before? Yeah. Okay. You've like frozen bananas. We're not going to dip them in chocolate this time, though. <laughs> so if you, if, you let, if you cut them up and you freeze it, you can do that too, right? Or you can buy frozen bananas in a bag, even cheaper, last longer. That's what we just kind of concluded, right? If you let them thaw out a little bit, and then you put them in the blender, blend them up, that's actually a pretty good ice cream. Okay. I wouldn't recommend eating it several days in a row. You'll get tired of it. Uh, our, our, our three little girls were not happy by day three of us experimenting with that. But it does make a good ice cream consistency, actually. So I'd go home and try it. And it's a cheap type of ice cream. And you don't have to feel so bad about it. Right? Uh, and again, small portions of things in general. But if you compare the two, the banana is going to have vitamins, minerals, fiber, but you're still gonna get that ice cream fix. Mm -hmm. So it has to be prepared though, like pretty timely. Let it thaw out a little bit, put it in the blender, blend it up until it's an ice cream consistency. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about are ways to eat some cheap snacks. Okay. So, I know we talked about the meals, trying to get it under a certain amount, but people like to snack, so we're gonna figure that part out. We're trying to pack in as much nutrition, pack in as many vegetables as we can, so a lot of this is gonna be vegetables that are super low cost, and be mindful of the serving size. Carrots are pretty reasonable. You buy the baby carrots, maybe a little bit more, not so much more. Baby carrots are just slivered down regular carrots, though. So it's okay to eat them. Um, the portions that even a little pouch will come in, it'll be a, a couple ounces, an ounce or two. Those calories are, are, are very, very light though. Right? Our fiber goal in general, women, 25 grams, men, 30 grams of fiber in a day. A serving of vegetables is three to five maybe. If you reach a goal of 25 grams of fiber, you will absorb almost 100 calories less in your day because they are going through you. This is insoluble fiber that's passing through you. Okay. So that's why I'm stressing the vegetables here. But carrots, even if you have it with a little bit of hummus, portion size, hummus isn't a legume. Hummus is a legume. It's a chickpea, right? blended up chickpeas with flavor. So carrots, broccoli, snow peas, that can take a long, go a long way and think about what you're eating. Think about the texture. Texture is a missed part because sometimes we're just trying to pile in the food without actually enjoying the texture sometimes. So mixing it up, right? The snap of snow peas, the crunch of peanuts. Peanuts can get you into trouble though, right? When I ask people how much peanuts they eat, they usually say a handful. I don't know what that means. So when you go home, go get a quarter cup out, right? Take a scoop of the peanuts. That's the highest serving size that generally we should have in a day, peanuts. When you think about a quarter cup. When you look at the nutrition label, most peanuts are going to say one ounce. So one ounce is pretty reasonable. It's easy to overdo peanuts, though, right? Probably worse than Pringles. Once you pop, you don't stop, right? Peanuts, you got to be careful because they're so little. Um, they're, they're higher in fat is why I say that. But... Peanuts are a legume, they have fiber. Okay. 
another reasonable option and be careful with the salt. You want generally a dry peanuts, not the added salt so much. Popcorn is another big one, right? Popcorn can also be overused if we're buying heavy buttered microwave popcorn. So we have to be really careful. A whole bag of popcorn, if it's buttered, it can be a few hundred calories even, um, at least sometimes. So making your own, right? Quarter cup of kernels, put it in a brown bag, put it in the microwave, keep an eye on it. Uh, and that is much more nutritious for you without the added fat and salt. So a lot of these things we're making on our own a little bit, but that's how we save money. That's how we stay more nutritious, more health, health focused. Now we get to the other part, eating out. What do we do there? So I, I knew you were coming is what the Mexican food is here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going we're gonna to add up, we're going to add up some calories here. Okay. Fast food can seem ex inexpensive, right? I'm shopping at the dollar menu. It's a dollar burger. It, it's so reasonable. And that's kind of right. I mean, it, it's cheap. They make it cheap because they buy in bulk, right? It's just we're here to live longer, healthier lives. So we have to be really careful. Um, if you are eating out, everybody wants to splurge every now and then. Think about lunch specials, lunch portions, early bird specials, and try not to have a sugared beverage. Any calorie beverage, you have to be really careful. So chips and queso. Ten chips and a small quarter cup of queso. How many calories do you all think that are in there? When we think about calories, we're aiming generally under 2,000, most people are going to be 1,700 to 2,000. Okay. The chips and queso, 10 chips, quarter cup, it'll be 300 calories. I think there's a lot more than 10 chips in most of these bowls though, so <laughs> it's easy to overdo it, I'll admit. So that's a few hundred calories. Enchiladas filled with cheese or meat, can't tell. The refried beans topped with the cheese, that's another seven, eight hundred calories even. It just depends on the portion size. So papillas, one of them, depending on the size, it'll be a 100 to 200 calories each. Put on, on the honey, putting on the powdered sugar, it'll amplify that calorie load. So the grand total for that would be 1,300 calories. Okay. And that's one person, <laughs> not, not of your sharing, obviously. Yeah, that's one meal, right? And we're shooting for under that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we didn't add the flour tortillas. I forgot about that. Oh, no, let's come. We've got to go back and recalculate. Yeah. No. All right. Okay, hold right there. This is a cob salad. Right? Cob salad has chicken, has eggs, has bacon. Right? And what do we top it with? It depends, right? Whatever you all like, the dressings. Is, it, is this worse than the Mexican food we just went over, or do you think it's better? Okay. Um, okay I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of in tricking mode right now. No, it, it's better. It's better. Okay, it's better. Uh, it is better. So remember the plate, right? Half of it with vegetables, protein, some carbs thrown in there. You have lettuce, cucumber, tomatoes. You have your proteins in the egg, proteins and cheese, proteins and chicken. So it's a little over on the protein side, probably. But overall, it's still much better. The dressing is where you have to be careful. So go ahead and click it, Joanne, if you could, please. So that one will get you about 800 calories with all of that. If you add dressing, it's going to be on top of it. And that's how we get ourselves into trouble. trouble because if you add um, a third cup of ranch, that, that may be a few hundred more calories. So you have to be very, very careful with the dressing. If you were to substitute that with a vinaigrette, balsamic vinaigrettes uh, is a good example of something you can use. That's going to be about half of the calories or so compared to those dressings but it's healthier fats, right? The grocery list, if you think back to that $2 of oils, 
Those oils are, should be high quality oils, things like an olive oil, right? Um, ranch dressing is a cream-based fat, so it is not going to have those omega-3s, those good, better fats for us. So we want to eat the lighter oil-based dressings more than a cream-based if you can, right? Obviously, if you need your blue cheese dressing fix, it's the portion. That's what it comes back to most times, especially when eating out. And, and I think that's probably the better take-home point is the dressing. So make your plate look like that other my plate. This is an example of one of the recipes that I've learned actually along the way. One of the things that I'm doing is a culinary medicine certification. So it's a combination of physicians learning with chefs and how to prepare food, what kinds of foods should we eat. This is one of the recipes that I've come across and it's a kid satisfier for the most part, I would say. Um, and it's a quick, very reasonable thing to do. Less than $2 per serving is this red beans and rice. So the ingredients I listed on the side here, we're gonna send you home with this recipe though. Uh, the serving size for this, um, it makes a large, large portion. Even if you break it down into sixes, uh, it'll be 300 calories, but it's kidney bean protein packed. It's optional to add pork. Uh, it's a quick meal that you can make for a couple dollars per serving, if that. Right, we gotta go back to our dried beans, it'll be much less. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another example that we'll send you with. Even though you may be spending more time, more money making that food at home, it feels like, in the long run, it's gonna save you things, right? How much does it cost for a stent? How much does it cost to have heart surgery? In the long run, it'll save you money to eat healthier and skipping that dollar burger, that $2 burger. Okay. These are some resources. So things like Meals on Wheels can be very helpful for people. I'd recommend you get with your primary care doctor. They can kind of give you some resources about that. Um, we have a resource for our Bernie patients and then our San Antonio patients too. Uh, food banks, uh, another great, great resource. Thank you back there to the control team <laughs> that we have. Um, but it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we are doing this quarterly, so get the word out. We're gonna be doing another one in February, and it's all part of our Healthy Living series, and it's gonna be Heart Healthy Living. Some of it is gonna circle back to these kinds of diets, but overall, they're gonna be uh, brand new presentations. Thank you so much for coming.